Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We're here live at the New York City stop of the Neo4j Graph Tour. Um, I'm here with David Fox, who is a senior software engineer at Adobe Behance. Uh, he's just given a wonderful presentation, which we will link to and have the recording to uh, later for you. Um, David, thank you so much for being here today. Sure, no problem. So I just wanted to sit down and talk with you. You've been around the Neo kind of uh, community for a while now. I wanted to see, how did, how did you originally find Neo? How did you originally come to Neo4j? So like back in 2013, I worked for uh, an online dating uh, company. Oh, and there, there were a lot of like kind of use cases in dating at that point. And we had a use case where we had a lot of Facebook uh, connected data of our users who were looking to make matches with other, other users. And we wanted to be able to show uh, this thing we called friends of friends, mm -hmm. uh, so like mutual connections you had with the people you were looking with within mm -hmm. the app. Um, and then we kind of wanted to take it out on another degree because there weren't enough immediate connections. So we wanted to go out to friends of friends, mm -hmm. uh, so like another level. Yeah. Uh, so we were kind of looking for ways to pull off that use case like way back uh, then. And one of my colleagues actually found Neo4j. Uh, and we actually work together at Adobe now, which is pretty funny too. Um, <laughs> That's but great. yeah, and, uh, and then we kind of got into it and we saw it was a really powerful tool for that use case. Very cool. And then you were the one to bring it into uh, Adobe and into Behance. So can you talk a little about your initial implementation? How are you guys using it? Um, what was the, I guess, the, the first implementation at Adobe that how you brought it in? Yeah, so we, uh, we had this activity feed uh, for Behance, which was like our main logged in user experience. And we were running it on Cassandra uh, at the time I came into the company. Um, and, and kind of since the beginning uh, of using that implementation, they were having some scaling issues and performance issues. Uh, and, and right when I kind of was introduced to it, like it kind of saw the possible graph use case on how, and how it might uh, work well. Um, so that, it took a couple of years, but that's uh, that's what we ended up implementing it for, uh, really to better our infrastructure and and, mm -hmm. and cost savings and, and that kind of stuff. That's great, and then but you didn't stop there, right? So you've got a couple other implementations going on where you've where you've used your Neo4j implementation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about kind of um, you've got the work in progress strips, you've got the homepage. Um, where where did it build from? Where did it build to? Yeah, so it's kind of like we, we implemented uh, Neo4j to replace Cassandra. We were really happy with the, uh, with the results. And then kind of slowly, uh, our, our product team was coming up with ideas they wanted to try to execute and kind of sheepishly asking us if they could, uh, if they could, you know, if they were possible. And mm -hmm. we were like, yeah, I think, I think the graph could handle this case. And, and one of those uh, kind of early ones uh, we have this work in progress uh, feature that you mentioned, and product wanted to be able to recommend a larger uh, subset of that content to specific users. So we had a lot of that data that we needed for like an algorithm to do that in Neo4j already. Uh, so to do to execute that, we we added a little more data, and we were able to uh, pull off a nice recommendation algorithm for work in progress. Uh, which saw a really nice improvement in how people were interacting with them. We saw a 20% increase in, oh, wow. in, yeah, in people interacting uh, with these works in progress as opposed to people who didn't see recommended uh, works in progress. So that was a successful uh, feature. And then the other use case you touched on was one really recently this summer. Uh, we kind of overhauled our uh, logged in uh, user experience. So we now have this this nice uh, continuous feed where we merged all these different views of content together. Uh, and it's really like, it's really custom uh, thought out presentation of data based on how we want to prioritize what uh, people see. That's very cool. And you talk a little, a, a little bit about kind of innovation. Um, at what point during the process did you realize that you could have multiple uses for Neo in, in this one instance? You know, was it like initially you brought in Neo knowing that you know, you could build tons of things from there, or was it just kind of like that Neo kind of lent itself to innovating and innovation? Yeah, I think like we, we brought it in knowing it could specifically address this use case and then kind of naturally the other uh, the other features and use cases started to start surface uh, mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, so with, with product asking for things and then, uh, than us saying, well, that's a good use case for the graph we already have, and we could probably execute it quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saw that start to happen a number of, of times on, the, on these projects, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was pretty cool. Yeah, great. Um, and then, so what, what was it, I guess, about Neo4j that um, 
led you to choose it as as your kind of your as your database for these projects? So for overhauling our, our infrastructure uh, that was in Cassandra, it was really how, how lean uh, graph database models could be. Uh, I, I always give the number that we went from a 50 terabyte Cassandra set to a 50 gigabyte uh, Neo4j data set. And, and a lot of people are very surprised by that. And uh, they, that's kind of, even though I like to talk about other things, that kind of attracts the most. Uh, mm -hmm questions and attention. But that's, I mean, it's a surprising number. It's like, wait, where did all your data go? <laughs> yeah, it, it just shows like if you have repeating data and, and you have uh, and you have like fan outs, I call them, where you store like every piece of data for, uh, for users going to a, a lean model where there's pretty much no repeating data. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of what you uh, see in a lot of cases. Yeah, flexible. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so you, you were the one that brought NeoJ into Adobe um, what was that buy-in process like? Because I know it's always a little bit, you know, scary. It's a new, it's a new database. It's a new type of technology. Um, how did you kind of sell everyone on Adobe? At Adobe. Yeah. So Adobe is obviously a huge tech company. We have a lot of teams all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so one of the first things was actually seeing if anybody was using it. Uh, and people had played with it in in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a wiki where we could kind of see uh, everything that's kind of happened uh, historically. Um, but nobody was using it in production or at the time. Nobody wanted to bring it in. So the actual pitch process was pretty difficult because uh, in general, I think at like tech companies and developers, they're hesitant to sometimes use new technologies, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to expressing data. Uh, people, I think, tend to, uh, you know, come complacent a little bit mm -hmm. with, with relational. Uh, so it, it really it really blossomed when I uh, when I built a proof of concept on, on my laptop with the actual uh, data that we would be using and showing like, hey, look, this is performant. It's exponentially less data <laughs> yeah and it, and it works well and they were like oh cool let's let's do it mm -hmm. very cool um and so then what was what was the development like what was kind of implementation like it was uh it was a good process we uh had a small team that, that i led to implement it um we had i did most of like the actual development we had a devops team that did most of the actual uh provisioning the infrastructure i, I would say uh about two or three worked with about two of them. Um, yeah, and, and it was a pretty straightforward process. One of the things that I've prided myself uh, on, and it, we had zero downtime uh, when we actually cut over wow. from this infrastructure. Wow. And that was, we going in, don't know if we were expecting. <laughs> nice surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. And like, so the learning curve, because you had a, you kind of had a large team that was, had to, you know, learn Cypher, learn Graph. Yeah. Um, what was that learning curve like? Was that? Yeah, I found it, People, they might not know anything about Graph or Cypher, but it's pretty intuitive. Like when you're mm -hmm. working with really great developers like I get to work with, they're able to pick up on it really quickly. Uh, even the use case of web recommendations, which was built by, by our, our, our research team. Um, they had no Neo4j experience and they were able to learn it really quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. And so um, were there any surprises in the process? Was that uh, in, in the process or maybe after implementation, were there any surprising things that Neo kind of allowed you to do or um, kind of gave you the ability to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I was kind of surprised even though I knew how well it works, um, how kind of intuitive the innovation on top of it was. Oh, uh, I love that. How, how the use cases kind of came naturally uh, to us just by saying we have this Thing product wants to implement, we think it's going to make the user experience better. And do we have a way to do it? And, mm -hmm. and the answer seems to be yes a lot with our graph, uh, mm -hmm. our, our graph data set. I think that's one thing. Uh, another thing is um, kind of like I touched on before, how people who have no experience with it are able to pick it up pretty pretty quickly if they're if they're skilled developers and skilled ops people. Uh, one of the coolest things is like I have some ops people that work on like our Neo4j infrastructure, and they have like they've taken it to like a really cool level. We we run it, um, we run it really effectively. We have a whole like backup strategy. We back up every hour. We have like automated restores that test uh, to make sure everything is still working. So we have a really nice process and that was developed by an ops team, by a DBA person mm -hmm. I work with. So other people who are not me um, and they've just took, took it really quickly. How big is the team that's working on Neo? Uh, so the immediate team that actually touches it, I would say is only about, we have about say three ops people who occasionally touch it. 
And then, uh, and then we have a DBA who, who's done a lot of uh, my, my colleague Gabe, who's done a lot of the backup strategy and, and some really cool stuff there. Very cool. And so, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have some uh, we have some cool uh, use cases actually in development. One of them is possibly user facing statistics that we uh, show users like in their profiles and things. Mm. Uh, moving that from a legacy system to using our graph uh, data set. Uh, another one is where, uh, for like kind of our search experience, we want to uh, we want to have this thing kind of like you would see like suggested tags. So like someone searches for a term and showing them suggestions of uh, ones that might be kind of like that or enhance their search experience. Mm -hmm. And we think collaborative filtering uh, that we have in the database could be really powerable for that. So mm -hmm. that might go uh, go in pretty That's soon. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me, for, for chatting with me here today, and for being here at, at Graph Tour New York. Um, no for those watching, we're going to post the link to David's video, um, his Graph Tour video, as well as probably a couple other because he's spoken at Graph Connect before, too. Um, but thank you all for joining, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, no problem.